Welcome to NPM's inaugural Interconnections Renewable Energy Professional Forum. My name is Alana Knopp, Senior Reporter with NPM, and we're thrilled to have you all join us today. Over the last several months, the renewable energy sector has gotten a major boost from the Biden administration's promised public investment of $400 billion over 10 years in clean energy technologies and innovation. To put that into context, that investment in today's dollars is twice the investment of the Apollo program that put a man on the moon. In other words, we are on the cusp of a clean energy revolution. We're pr privileged to be joined today by a panel of top talent in the renewable energy space to find out how they are preparing their companies to take advantage of this anticipated growth. First, I'd like to welcome Johanna Affinjar, Senior Director of Capital Markets at Clearway Energy. Johanna leads fundraising of debt and equity to support Clearway's business and has been instrumental in shaping the company's finance function, as well as building its teams and culture. We're also joined by Benjamin Baker, Managing Director of Greenbacker Development Opportunities Fund, who leads the origination and execution of Greenbacker's development capital and private equity investments. Ben brings deep experience across the renewable energy industry, having held positions in both development and private equity. We have Richard DeVere, Chief Investment Officer at EDP Renewables Distributed Generation, where he leads capital investment and overall market strategy for the platform's more than $500 million portfolio of operating and development assets. Rich has more than a decade of experience developing, structuring, and financing award-winning renewable power generation projects in the United States and Europe. And Will Mitchell, Vice President for Business Development in the Western United States for Strata Clean Energy. Will is responsible for commercial and development activities, as well as policy initiatives and public affairs, all in support of Strata solar and storage projects. Thank you all for being here. Um, we're really excited uh, to have you launch uh, this inaugural panel, and we would love to start off with each of you giving a brief overview of your company, as well as your company's latest efforts as we move further into 2021. So Ben, can we start this off with you? Greenbacker as a firm is about 10 years old. The firm uh, got its start uh, with, with a view towards democratizing investment in uh, sustainable infrastructure, meaning the first vehicle that they formed was uh, it raises retail capital. So you could put you know part of your retirement account into a solar farm or a wind farm. And so that's how they historically have been raising money. And, and that fund has now grown to well over a billion dollars uh, over the past few years. Um, you know, and, and then about uh, about a year ago, I joined to launch uh, GDEV, which, you know, still works in the same ecosystem of, of regional uh, renewable energy developers, sustainable infrastructure developers, uh, but we provide more flexible, uh, typically corporate level capital uh, to developers. So as a firm, you know, we are uh, very active, I would say, in sort of the middle market of uh, renewable energy development and infrastructure uh, across the U.S. That's great. Thank you, Ben. And let's turn to Rich now. Uh, EDPR, uh, North America Distributed Generation, is a new part of EDPR. Uh, EDPR is the uh, globally is the fourth largest owner of wind power in the world and uh, one of the largest owners of renewables in the United States. Uh, the Distributed Generation Endeavor is a new uh, part of that strategy, which came as a consequence of an acquisition of a company that I had co-founded uh, six years ago called C2 Energy Capital. Uh, we brought uh, a portfolio of operating assets and development assets and a team uh, over. Uh, and now uh, we are we are part of executing with uh, the benefits of the resources of EDPR, a, a much broader distributed generation strategy uh, in the US uh, that includes a growth plan of uh, 
uh, you know, targeting over 300 megawatts a year of new distributed generation. Great. Thank you, Rich. And now we'll turn to Will. Thanks for having us. Strata is really emblematic of the growth of the solar industry. The company uh, has been around for a little over a decade, uh, but started doing small rooftop jobs uh, and then gradually grew into small ground mount projects and then larger ground mount projects. And now today our company is responsible for the largest solar project east of the Mississippi in Virginia. And then we just brought online one of the largest standalone battery storage projects in the US, uh, 100 megawatt, 400 megawatt hour project out in California that's gonna be serving resource adequacy for Southern California Edison for the next 20 years. And so we're uh, family owned still, which is something we're very proud of. Um, we've got a portfolio from coast to coast, uh, recently just received some additional um, development capital. And so we're, we're looking at growth, meeting all the opportunities you know, that are being created by the Biden administration, and then just generally the, the growth driven by the pure economics of renewables. So really happy to be here and talk more about that today. Thank you so much, Will. Appreciate that. And Johanna. For having us. Um, so Clearway um, started about eight, eight years ago, um, and I've been with the company for seven years. I was one of the first batch of employees back then. Um, we are a renewable energy company, one of the biggest in the United States, and we are a developer of wind, solar, and storage. So we have a pipeline of about 10 gigawatts. Um, and through our affiliate, uh, which is publicly traded, CWEN, we um, are owner of about five gigawatts of projects and where we manage them and we also operate those projects. Um, so our mission is to provide clean energy to our customers um, and you know, help bring us, all of us, to a world where we're 100% uh, clean energy. So um, this, is, this is our mission. We'll, I'm sure we'll talk about that and how it fits into, into current legislative changes. Um, and um, in terms of what we're kind of doing right now into 2021, um, we're focusing on new geographies. We're, we're present nationwide. Um, and, and, and we are creating forays into, into new states. So West Virginia, for example, we're the first wind producer there. Um, and obviously new technology as well through, through storage. That's great. Thank you, Johanna. And so uh, I'll stay with you if I may. I'd like to ask you how Clearway is positioning itself ahead of this major anticipated, you know, renewable energy growth, especially in relation to the Biden administration's infrastructure plan. Yeah, uh, sure. So, so at Clearway, we we, we support the um, the American Jobs Plan and, and the goal to 100% clean energy. Um, this is our mission. Um, so the plan supports our mission, and and we support the plan. Um, we we have a 10 gigawatt pipeline so features of the plan will help us accelerate when we develop this pipeline um, specifically there's features in the plan such as um, enhancements and extensions of credits towards renewables that will help us develop our pipeline um, and and we were positioned as well um, through, you know, being very active in the legislation process. So there's the plan and now there is how we implement the plan, how we make it practical and, and something that's going to be implemented. So very active, we're very active in that as well. And, you know, participating in the legislative process um, to make this plan happen. That's actually really interesting to hear you talk about, you know, your kind of connection with with policy. And um, Ben, I'm I'm wondering if you can kind of expand on that a little bit and talk about, you know, not only how Greenbacker is preparing itself, um, you know, in relation to the Biden infrastructure plan, but also kind of, you know, what what you're looking at as far as you know maybe policies within that plan. 
Yeah, no, ha happy to speak about that. You know, I joined here under the prior administration and um, probably sometime around last October, November, you know, again, we're kind of actively fundraising still. And so I was pitching um, the fund, you know, as if uh, as if that administration would have a second term, you know. So so for me, uh, you know, I still uh, come to work and do probably what I would have been doing, um, albeit with, I think, a lot more regulatory uh tailwind than, than we would have otherwise had. Um, you know, we see a lot of great legislation coming out of states, you know, whether that's Virginia and the, the Clean Energy Act or, or, or other markets that we're starting to enter. And so a lot of it's always been um, state driven and, and we still focus on that. Um, you know, so, so again, it's kind of a non-answer because, you know, we don't look to federal policy to guide what we're doing. You know, I think what we saw coming into probably last year, uh, as we were talking about launching this fund, was the the economics of renewables and really the the capital inflows into ESG focused funds and really the climate and other ESG uh, just demands on behalf of of the investment community, and we really see that. As, as driving the future here. And so, you know, we, we already had an eye towards, hey, we have a vehicle that is a buyer of assets, but we need a vehicle that is backing the seller of assets too, that is that is backing development just as the pace of development is, is set to explode. And again, we saw that happening from a mix of sources from state legislation to the economics of the technologies um, to, uh, to just the general demands of investors, as I said. So um, I would say it's less policy driven, but but the timing is the same. And so we're sitting here wanting to make sure that we drive the pace of new development and we, fi we finance that development activity in addition to to coming into to projects that, that uh, are at NTP or later. Um, so I think that's how we're thinking of it, uh, at least in the life cycle of, uh, of project development and project finance. Uh, and, and then, of course, I think we have an eye towards towards what's next. You know, we've spent when I say we Greenbacker, uh, you know, before I got here, but the, the company spent a decade creating a name and creating expertise and a machine in solar and wind and, and lately batteries. Um, but, you know, if you look at what's next, whether it's hydrogen, carbon capture, um, electric vehicles, charging and, and fleet electrification, uh, just grid resiliency generally with a mix of batteries uh, transmission upgrades and otherwise, uh, I think we're, we're thinking about what's next. We're thinking about how to support not just renewable generation, but grid resiliency and, and how our aging kind of infrastructure uh, accepts or adapts to the, the intermittency of the, the generation. So that's that's where our head's at is is both, you know, being in the corner of developers while still providing long term infrastructure capital and then having an eye towards what's next uh, technologically and, and again, making sure that the, the grid and the infrastructure of the U.S. can can handle everything that we're doing to it. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Thank you. And Rich, obviously, you're very deeply involved in distributed generation um, at EDPR. So I'd love to hear from you. Uh, how EDP is getting ready of this huge growth and, of course, looking at, at the infrastructure plan. Yeah, I mean, look, EDP, EDPR uh, is, is really becoming, you know, the driving force of the, the EDP uh, engine generally. And, and there's a massive growth plan, uh, you know, massive multi-gigawatt growth plan that exists from the EDPR uh, global standpoint of which DG in North America and DG globally is a part of, uh, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, like, like Ben, I mean, you know, we, we saw the greatest growth at, at the predecessor company during the Trump administration. Uh, and um, that, that I don't view that as a consequence of, you know, the Trump administration, I view it as a consequence of, uh, you know, the, the policies that came prior to that. And I think that ultimately, um, you know, as the infrastructure plan goes, that momentum is already there. Um, so, you know, EDP are relative to the, through the DG lens, you know, we go from being a smaller scale developer uh, into a, um, into a uh, platform that has a substantial government affairs capability. In fact, one of the individuals who's on the management committee of the, the DG team is actually the head of government affairs for North America. Um, and, 
what we are really seeing is an attitude around distributed generation that it is enabling more of the thinking around creative utility scale projects, developments, um, structures, rather than it being sort of at um, uh, you know at a loggerhead. And and so ultimately, uh, the infrastructure plan we we think will will encourage more thinking around uh, how to do renewables creatively uh, and, and to, you know, as we go to this phase that is beyond the low hanging fruit, uh, you know, with the Walmarts of the world or the large utility scale PPAs where people have to think more dynamically. And I think it extends, in fact, even beyond just the infrastructure plan, I think it extends to the attitude of the administration generally, um, the appointment of Jigger Shaw to the head of the loan of the DOE uh, loan guarantee office is another example of that. Uh, where it's some of it is going to be done through congressional policy and some of it is going to be done through the tone that the administration uh, puts out of that this is a priority. And uh, we're very excited about that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and Will, same question to you, but obviously from the kind of solar and storage perspective, how are you looking at all of this? Absolutely. So echoing what everyone has said in terms of getting through the the, the challenges of the Trump administration, um, you know, most of these firms, if not all of them, were, were well on their way during the Obama administration. And, and, and then um, so Trump came in and uh, I, I think, you know, the states really responded um, both from a um, regulatory process and a legislative process, as well as just the economics. Of, of the market kept things moving during the Trump administration and where things got complicated with the Trump administration had to do with his his macro approach to globalization and supply chain and that's really I think where the industry um, was able to uh, weather some some really big challenges because this is you know this is a global industry we have global supply chains um, and there was a lot of uh, concern around that with um, the trade case for solar um, and you know wind dealt with similar issues. But now, you know, there, there's clearly it's really nice to have um, an administration that is you know, pro renewable and and also a Congress that is pro renewable. Um, there was a mention of the tax credits. You know, there, there's three pieces of legislation or excuse me, um, two pieces of legislation working their way through one in the House, one in the Senate. Both would extend solar and wind tax credits, would also include battery energy storage and the tax credits transmission would be eligible for tax credits. There's potential hydrogen carbon reduction tax credits. So there, there's a lot of, um, there, there's proven um, tax incentives that are looking to be extended for quite a period of time, which is absolutely just going to ensure that the um, Biden plan or, or, you know, state RPSs or just generally the transition continues in a, in a really aggressive manner. Um, and so we're incredibly excited about it. It's not to say that there's not challenges across the industry, particularly around interconnection. There was a really interesting report that came out of the federal level, uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab a couple of weeks ago, just talking about how the grid is just uh, at a, you know, not a breaking point, but just so congested that it's really delaying the country's progress toward clean energy solutions because there's just not enough pipes and wires to move move power around, uh, move clean energy around, move, move electrons. So I think we need to see a lot more investment in that um, whether it's directly through from the utilities or independent developers, but we clearly need more transmission. So we're able, all our companies are able to realize these projects that, that we're um, bringing, bringing to the fore. And most importantly, we got to continue to be competitive. Um, you know, th there's uh, you know, battery storage costs are going to continue to come down as manufacturing ramps up. Um, solar costs are uh, astoundingly low. Um, probably see some leveling there. I'm not sure they can actually go much lower, um, but you know, clearly beating out natural gas um, as, as an alternative, particularly when you integrate wind and battery storage and solar and battery storage and can provide that, that, that firm resource um, that can really serve those long-term capacity challenges that you're seeing. So overall, it's, it's fantastic to have the support on the federal level, um, also support on the state level, but at the end of the day, as the industry continues to scale, our economics get better and better and we become more competitive and we get smarter with what we do and we'll win, we'll all win more RFOs and, and that's good for the planet and it's good for bringing carbon down and, and it's good for consumers. 
Yeah, it sounds like we're in a good place as far as um, re renewable energy. Um, and I want to I want to keep you on this issue for a moment, Will. Um, as far as you mentioned challenges, and I'm wondering um, what's keeping you up at night. You mentioned a couple of things um, as far as these challenges that currently exist in your specific sector in which you work and i'm curious how your your company is responding to those challenges sure uh, two things keep me up at night one is the interconnection process that i mentioned um, it is uh, incredibly competitive and um, the 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 studies and the schedule by which entities work really hard to try to get these studies done to get these projects online gets delayed more and more every year. It used to be an 18 month process, it's now 36 or, you know, 36 is 50 months in some instances. Um, and I think that's a combination of, there's not enough uh, staff uh, working on these matters uh, at the agencies. There's just so many projects trying to interconnect. Um, and then also uh, you're, you have so much related infrastructure, upgrading a transmission line or building a new transmission line can take a decade um, plus. Um, and so there's just uh, the, the lack of ability to move power around or the system to handle all this power coming onto it keeps me up at night for sure. Um, these are solvable problems, but um, in longer time frames than I think developers are used to. Um, and so there, there's a big bottleneck there, which is unfortunate, um, but not, not unexpected. Um, this, this has been kind of building for a long time. The other one is supply chain, particularly around batteries. Um, there is so much demand for electric vehicles, which is fantastic. There's so much demand for standalone uh, battery energy storage projects, which is fantastic. The manufacturing capacity is, is honestly having a hard time ramping up to meet it. Um, and also having, you know, tier one, really quality uh, tier one manufacturers of batteries. Um, there are uh, the requirements for standalone battery storage, the integration for safety and fire risk and first responder integration is really mission critical because you can't have um, you can't have a large scale accident at the battery storage level and expect the industry to continue uh, to grow the way it is. I think the public won't have it, regulators won't have it, and so it's really critical to have that tier one manufacturing um, globally, domestically. I think we all know Tesla, they're a great example, but globally, we, you know, we need to really grow that. So there's competition in the market, drives prices down, um, but they're integrating um, the safety features that are necessary to make sure that these projects can come online and do what they say they're gonna do for 20 years and, and make sure everyone stays safe along the way. Yeah, and I, I think you bring up, you know, obviously those challenges that you, you brought up namely interconnection and um, supply chain. Uh, those are obviously things that we, we hear about and those are definitely challenges. And um, Rich, I'm wondering what that might look like on you know the distributed generation level. Like what, what are you dealing with as far as some of these challenges? Yeah, I mean, look, so distributed generation can mean a lot of different things. Uh, when we're talking about behind the meter, it's obviously this interconnection component is less of an issue than for some of our community solar or, or small dis or distributed scale uh, ground mount projects that are front of the meter, uh, where we definitely suffer from the same, the same uh, circumstances. I think that uh, there are potentially some other fixes that could exist. Um, that could help mitigate this, uh, but it's not necessarily for around, um, you know, how, how tax law looks at it, you know, place and service and things like that. But that, that's sort of just that's putting a bandaid over the problem. I think that the, the major issues around uh, around interconnection absolutely are a concern uh, for us. Um, and, and I think it's it's, you know, sometimes I think it's it's a matter of saying it's a concern for us as members of the industry. I think it represents uh, a broader uh, risk as a citizen in the United States. I mean, there's a keeping me up at night as a as as a professional in this industry, and then there's a keeping me up at night around cybersecurity and grid resiliency, which must be addressed. And that's one of the things relative to the the infrastructure bill uh, and 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 things like FERC 2222 uh, that that I'm excited to really see uh, how the United States looks at this moving forward. Um, you know, we we every other week we're hearing about you know pipeline hack or 
yesterday with JBL with um, you know meat processing. That that is our that is the American infrastructure, and you know that's the price of gas going up or the price of beef going up is one thing, but people not having electricity is another. So uh, this is definitely an issue um, that that needs to be addressed, and uh, and and I think that there needs to be a more uh, uh, FERC driven approach. Uh, to how to look at these things, uh, to be able to, to push the, the ISOs and the RTOs, uh, and then subsequently down all the way to, to the utility level, uh, just because it, it puts it puts a great <clears throat> amount of pressure on on groups like uh, like ours and Clearway and Strata uh, to be able to manage projects that you know you can build in six or seven months, but you can't interconnect for six or seven years. Uh, so it's definitely it's definitely an issue. Yeah, no, you bring up a lot of critical points there. Uh, Johanna, I'm curious, how are you looking at this um, from Clearway's perspective as far as tackling yeah. some of, of your challenges? Yeah, no, for sure. And, and you know, I'm hearing Will and Rich and what they're saying, and, and, and it all brings me to what keeps me up at night and a lot of us, which is kind of our young generations. And the reason why I say that is because there is a problem of staffing um, and you know, we'll mention that there's a problem of staffing when we interact with some of the authorities having jurisdiction or utilities and people um, who are helping us and have a role to play in providing permitting, um, helping interconnection deployment, uh, authorizations to interconnect, all those steps in our development are critical, not only because they're critical because that's what we need to get the electrons into the grid, but they're critical also because they tie into receipt of capital, for example, or receipt of tax credits. These are tied to critical milestones that the projects need to um, achieve. And so, so when I say young generation, it's you know bringing more people. And so I spend a lot of my time talking to young people bringing talent um, you know, to join Clearway, but to join our industry in general, because I feel that we, we have a shortage of, of people and staff in general. So whether it is within our companies um, or you know, within government or at the state or federal level. Um, and so we're very active in that as well. Um, the, 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 the critical timelines don't depend only on us, they depend on, on many stakeholders that we're working with very closely. And so um, this kind of ties all of this together, you know, it, it ties also the conversation around um, legislation that we were talking about earlier. Um, there is a plan, which is great, but now there's the implementation of the plan. And so people within our companies, staff, young generations, we all work with our counterparts within government to make it happen. So that's kind of what keeps us, us at night also a lot, and it ties everything together as well. Yeah, that's really interesting, actually. You bring up a couple of really um, critical points there. And Ben, I'd love for you to round out um, this particular question for us as far as um, What's keeping you up at night um, and some of the challenges that you're, you're looking to tackle? Well, now everybody's taking all my answers, so I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think everybody has hit more or less on on the things that that keep us up. You know, I think when you, when we're thinking about 2030 goals or 2050 goals, you know, I think that we're all, um, you know, we have a bunch of smart people that are working on this. And I think we get there. I think, you know, at least personally investing out of a seven year fund, I'm kind of thinking in that time period or for the next half of a decade, say, you know, we're dealing with a lot of the things that, that uh, you know, everybody talked about, you know, on the one hand, you know, we are we are sitting here on the precipice of, of a, you know, just a huge explosion, as we said before, of, of renewable energy development. And, you know, of course, that will also make some of us or some some assets a, a victim of our own success, right? Um, so the interconnection queue is obviously a piece of it. You know, we have uh, partners who are who are in PJM. You know, who are seeing delays. We have partners 
who are working in Maine who have been dealing with CMP up there. Um, sometimes the issue is that you have a utility um, that, that you know, wants to stand in the way of development. Sometimes it's just that they're understaffed or, or lacking in expertise. Um, you know, on the other hand, some markets, the, the, th the bar is set too low for who can enter the queue. Um, so that's obviously, you know, something, something to work on is, is what is that threshold that allows you to secure Q position. But nonetheless, we as an investor, you know, the mitigant for us is that we have a bit more diversification across, you know, a number of markets um, and a number of companies. I guess everyone on the phone uh, does have access to a bunch of markets as well. Um, and, and the best thing that you can do is be realistic about timing. So as we're developing projects today, in the queue in, in PJM or in Virginia, we have assets that we know are 2024 or 2025 NTPs. And the best thing you can do is be realistic about it. Um, you know, the other things that we see um, on the supply chain, you know, we, we have a one of our partners, you know, could have built another 50 megawatts this year, but for steel prices. And so pushed, you know, a number of assets into 22 just because of where that market was. We have folks who are having a tough time in the tight labor market um, securing EPC availability, you know, let alone um, the price, you know, even even at the right price, you can't uh, find the labor. So I think over time, we're going to be uh, in in this kind of tight labor market, especially within our own industry here, um, where development's just exploding and construction is, is really ramping up over the next few years. And then the supply chain piece um, will just get harder and harder because, you know, as we solve you know, maybe the quote unquote easier issues or the things that we were solving five, 10 years ago. Now we're looking at where where cobalt comes from, where lithium comes from, where silicon comes from, how modules are, are sourced. Uh, and as we get farther and farther up into the, the upstream part of the supply chain, I think that'll even further narrow the choices that are either approved by banks uh, and financiers or, or accepted by kind of the investment community based on, you know, ESG standards. And, and you know, we, we have our own ESG standards. We have an ESG policy um, that looks at a number of criteria across those three letters. And um, yeah, there could be concerns, you know, on a number of different levels up into the supply chain. So, you know, I think it's, it's just gonna get harder, um, you know, just like we're seeing today with, with batteries. Um, it, it probably won't get easier in the next half a decade. Yeah, you know, that's a great response. And as we were talking, I'm thinking to myself, you know, wow, you really have to be, when you're in this sector, you really have to be looking at so many different things at one time. Um, and you laid that out really well, you know, from the price of steel, looking at cobalt, like just all these things coming together, talking about FERC policy. So that's really interesting. Ben, I'm going to stay with you now. I want to switch gears a little bit. I want to talk about broader trends and disruptions um, that you're looking at and you think other people should be looking at too. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, I will not claim to be on the cutting edge of, of anything. Um, but I think that one thing, one thing that we're good at, and I think a, a bunch of folks on the, the call are good at too, is, is community solar and kind of looking at alternative um, forms of, of revenue um, contracts, you know, and we're seeing this across our portfolio in, in a lot of interesting ways. I mean, we have community solar development in Maryland, in New York, group net metering in Maine. We have two different hydro partners. Um, so we have a hydro partner who is working on, uh, you know, working within the group net metering programs in Maine and in New Hampshire. We have a, a partner in New York who is taking hydro facilities that are, you know, unloved and, and, and perhaps merchants are coming to the end of a contract and putting them into VEDER which is New York's uh, way of valuing a, a kilowatt hour of, of renewable energy. Um, and, and so it's a, we're kind of at an interesting time where, of course, you know, long-term PPAs are the gold standard and they exist, um, but there's a lot of kind of, you know, middle ground that we're able to cover by connecting um, centralized generation to, to retail load. So I think that's something that is not, kind of, not earth shattering, but something where we have a lot of access and a lot of expertise um, I think at this point. So, you know, may, that's probably my main answer as far as what we're involved in that is, I think, somewhat forward looking at least. Yeah, thank you. That That's really interesting. Um, and Rich, I'd love to turn this over to you. 
Yeah, I mean, look, I think from a, um, you know, the, the, the forward looking part of our day to day is less about the, uh, you know, the, the construction of a particular project, though there is actually really fascinating work that's being done on asset optimization um, and, and thinking about, you know, how you how you squeeze more out from from an asset uh, from a revenue standpoint, but also I think that plays into you know the discussion more generally about you know uh, commodity uh, pricing and uh, and capex and and I think that what's really happening is with you know as as the industry has matured and the people who are on this phone call have been in it uh, for for a long time, um, it's uh, it, it is exceptionally price sensitive. Uh, exceptionally price sensitive. It's uh, and so you know the optimizations that go from on a, on a software and technology standpoint for you know minimizing how much steel we put into the ground uh, and, and, and all the way through you know system design uh, is 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 definitely more more prevalent uh, for us. Really, where I think we uh, will 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 shine, um, and I, I think is sort of distributed gen has sort of led. Um, led, led the way to a certain extent uh, on some of the more innovative structures um, where we will shine uh, will we'll be around, uh, you know, arrangements and thinking that move away from sort of the traditional 10, 15, 20 year PPA uh, and then a merchant assumption um, and how we look at, you know, broader deployment and evaluating credit uh, and, and market dynamics that we can leverage. Um, and 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 then you know there's sort of the the, the thing that I I spend my time reading uh, because I think it'll be fascinating uh, and it will it will be a very very different world is the impact of FERC 2222. Uh, it will just it'll just be a very different world for how the utilities will interact with distributed resources um, in a way that uh, is really you know addressing what we're talking about from the interconnection standpoint. I mean I think realistically even if we wanted to. Um, you know, whether it's a staffing standpoint, uh, you know, on the utility side, whether it's construction labor, whether it's a materials availability, we cannot build as much transmission as we need to. So we have to come up with other ways of dealing with this. And the other way to deal with less transmission is managing distributed consumption, managing efficiency uh, and, and, and scheduling. And, and it will, it, it, it is, definitely a big part of the conversation. Those deals are harder to do, but what I think you will find is that policy will start to move in a more innovative way of making those types of uh, uh, endeavors more uniform. Thank you. And Johanna, I'm wondering if, you know, R Rich and Ben just, just laid that out for us. I'm wondering if you're um, seeing some of the same things at Clearway, um, <sighs> And you know, just kind of what what you're looking are, out for as far as you know trends. Yeah, no, it's very interesting, and and I like this topic because when we talk about innovation and disruption, I mean, there's there's two things. There's the innovation of what we're currently doing and how are we doing it, and there's like little bit by bit we're innovating. So you know, Ben mentioned community solar. That's definitely one big area of our industry um, and we were pioneers as well in this we started in over five years ago and it was you know a couple of small projects in colorado and now we stand today and we have developed over 500 megawatts but there's always innovation in community solar in the way we um so it, community solar for for your listeners is um bringing clean energy directly to the consumer through the grid. So we contract directly with our consumers, with our customers. And um, and the way we contract with our customers has evolved over time. And the requirements from our financiers has evolved over time. And there's innovation constantly on how we structure community solar. And I think that's fascinating, fascinating because it's a way for people who don't have a roof to get access to clean energy, to renewable energy. And, um, and so, yeah, so that's innovation. It's not something that is brand new. 
because we've been doing community solar for several years, but there's innovation that is required in the way we develop it. So um, that's one kind of one type of, of trend that we see for sure. And then obviously there is other trend around kind of big disruption, big innovation. Um, storage is one. Um, and so for now, everything that all of us here are doing is about the more traditional storage solutions that we know. So the ones that you know we have in our smartphones are the kind of the ones that we use on our power plants. Um, but there is dozens of other ways of thinking about storage. Um, so we're keeping an eye on that. And for us, we're interested in the point in time when those new technologies in storage will be at a point where they can be uh, commercialized, um, bankable. So that's definitely a trend that we see. And I'm looking forward to see other solutions for storage. Um, which will help also, you know, all the topics we were talking about around supply chain and, and uh, raw material. Um, that there's one. Obviously, there's hydrogen, which we haven't talked about yet. It's the big elephant in the room. Um, all companies are creating experts team to get smarter. Um, I'm, I'm also very much looking forward for that. I think this is going to be a big trend because it's going also to help us tie to, you know, transportation and, 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 you know, like this revolution we're talking about. So that's going to be super interesting. And so these two, you know, storage and, and hydrogen, these are big trends, innovations, disruptions um, it, that are coming on top of the kind of small level granular innovations that we do on a day-to-day -day basis on things like community solar. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and naturally, um, Will, you know, we've talked about community solar now. Uh, I'd love to know what, you know, Strata is looking at as far as, you know, things to look out for around community solar. Um, I know you guys do a lot of that and storage as well. Yeah, absolutely. So number one for storage is, is making sure that, because it is somewhat of a, a nascent resource still, is making sure that the utilities are modeling it correctly in their integrated resource plan, right? If they're not, um, it's easy to dismiss if they're working with a cost curve from three years ago, or they're not understanding some of the dynamics on use case or other things like that. So there, there, there is a lot of um, mad science, so to speak, that's still involved with designing these projects, making sure they're, they're serving the needs um, and also, you know, if you want to buy some batteries and you'd like them to last for 20 years, it's an entirely different use case than if you want to buy some batteries and have them last eight or 10 years. And so you really got to understand that. You got to model that. Um, you got to make sure the utilities has the pricing around that. So, and we're seeing, I think, incredible progress on that, but there's still always work to be done, making sure that, you know, the, the, the pricing in the industry is moving so fast and the utility integrated resource plan process just by its nature, it tends to be pretty slow, sometimes a multi-year process. Making sure those inputs are as up-to-date as possible is really um, imperative for the industry. And I think that the trade associations, um, whether it's, you know, SIA or ESA or ACP or, you know, or the local trade associations, being involved in those IRP processes are really, really important. And, and now you're seeing, you know, just the other day, SIA came out with a um, kind of a wing focused just on storage. And ESA is focused just on storage, and ACP is focused on utility scale wind and solar and storage. And so, you know, it's right there in the mix with everybody. On the solar standpoint, uh, from the solar standpoint, it, it really, you know, the, the big factors are um, supply chain. There was a mention earlier about, you know, where sil, you know, particularly polysilicon is coming from. There's been, uh, rightfully so, a lot of attention brought to some of the labor practices overseas and whether those need to be addressed and. and and I think what you're going to end up seeing is a lot more transparency in supply chain, similar to the transparency in supply chain on storage where, you know, where's the cobalt coming from? Um, you know, what are the labor practices to do that? And these are, these are hard conversations to have. Um, they probably will have short-term cost impacts on the industry, but long-term, these, these are the right things to do um, to make sure that, uh, you know, the, the industry is growing in a just way up and down, not just for consumers, but, but for everyone involved. Um, and so uh, that will likely impact pricing a little bit. 
and then there continues to be innovation, you know, at the panel level where you've got bifacial panels now, which are which are incredible, particularly in certain environments. Um, you've got in, improved racking technologies, which are fantastic. Um, and then just general efficiency with with you know EPC. When I started in the industry, you know, you had to put a panel on with um, you know six to eight brackets, and now a panel can get clipped on with two brackets. And so that's just um, that much less aluminum and steel you need, that much less labor you need, um, and you're still getting the same quality product. I mean, it's just learning um, along the way. And so I think you're going to continue to see that. Um, and so uh, in, in terms of areas that are exciting, there was a mention of green hydrogen, a lot of attention there, particularly if we see some action out of the, at the federal level to help incentivize that. I think there, there's a lot of growth potential there um, to ensure that manufacturing um, is, is utilizing clean energy. Um, advancement of uh, distributed resources participating in the wholesale market, you know, stringing together um, communities as kind of virtual power plants, seeing more and more of that in, in the in the markets. Um, uh, energy efficiency aggregation, I think, is really cool. Um, starting to see a lot more of that. Um, and overall, so the you know the amount of investment coming into the industry, both kind of your traditional private equity infrastructure investment, and then also really seeing a resurgence of that um, venture capital money as well, technology space, software plays in the industry is really growing it across the board, both for consumers directly, as well as utilities. Um, and of course, corporates right in the middle with, with you know, Google, a great example, I believe it was Google saying that they're gonna um, uh, adjust their cloud such that if, if you're uh, tasked, if you're tasking your cloud with doing something um, that's energy intensive, it will actually delay that until um, there's renewable energy being utilized. And so they're you know, kind of almost like time of use, but for data centers to ensure that you're relying more on renewables instead of brown power. And so I think that that's pretty fantastic on their, on their path and Facebook's path, and Apple's all the big um, tech, Amazon, all the big tech companies path to, to be relying on renewable energy um, at all their data centers and, and through their operations and then through their supply chain. Yeah, we're definitely hearing a lot of a lot of that, which is really great and encouraging to hear. Um, well, I'd like to stay with you for a moment and switch gears to COVID recovery. You know, obviously it's been quite a year, a year and a half, and I'm wondering how you see your the, the renewable energy space, um, how you see that in the context of COVID recovery going forward. By and large, the renewable energy space, the clean energy space, did fairly well through COVID. Um, and, and you know, perfect example of you know the long lead time infrastructure projects, patient investment. Um, and while there was various you know changes, short term changes in energy demand, you're seeing across the board energy demand going up, um, particularly in areas where you know there's incredible new growth. Uh, Texas, Desert Southwest, elsewhere. And so I think the industry um, actually uh, fared pretty well uh, through 2020 and hit 2021 at a pretty healthy pace that is uh, positioning the industry to grow. Um, there are, you know, you just look on LinkedIn, there are an enormous number of openings um, across the board at all levels of the industry for all types of roles. Um, you know, the, in, the recruitment space in clean energy is booming right now. There's an incredible amount of money, particularly with the oil, international oil super majors coming in and all investing very, very heavily in the U.S. Um, uh, domestic renewable space. Um, so I, I think the industry is, is poised to put COVID in the rearview mirror um, and really help this economy at a, at a macro level um, be a, you know, one of the leaders, uh, you know, the leading growth stories coming out of COVID that helps rebuild this economy nationally. And then at a, at a state level, um, pretty much everywhere. I can't think of one state right now that is not incredibly hot and busy on renewables. Putting aside, you know, political pundits and and some headlines, um, there's activity in in all 50 states uh, without question. Well, that's really good to hear. And Ben, I'm curious is is that what you're is that what you're seeing and feeling as far as you know sustainable investments, clean energy investments? Does it look good? 
Yeah, for, for sure. And I'll just echo um, uh, the last point about just kind of looking across the U.S. I think we've invested as a firm in over 30 states. So we're not in 50, but agreed that stuff's going on all over the place. We have uh, some solar farms in, in Wyoming and Montana now. These are states that, you know, historically we haven't really been talking about in, in the context of renewables. Um, but yeah, look, I, I think going through 2020, there was all, all sorts of articles about um, renewables being the, uh, the calm in the storm or being a safe haven. And I think if anything, the asset class benefited through COVID. You know, we as a firm saw increased capital inflows um, as a result because, you know, folks saw that the, uh, the assets were doing what they said they were going to do. I mean, other than perhaps a, uh, a near-term kind of reduction in, in uh, load growth, um, people were home using their screens uh, and, and using a bunch of power. So, um, you know, I think it was a generally an okay pandemic for the industry other than um, having construction, you know, shut down for a period of time. I think coming out of this, you know, clearly it is, you know, lo- looking back to to uh, the New Deal and just things like that. I mean, it's it's a great way to to, to rebuild the economy is, is get folks working, um, you know, in this industry. So I think it all, it's all coming together, you know, an, an economic crisis that needs um, digging out of combined with, like I was talking about earlier, the ESG demands, um, you know, for, for climate uh, focused investments, um, legislation that we're seeing at both the state and federal level and just the economic parity of a lot of these technologies. So I think coming out of this, um, if anything, similar to our comments about the interconnection queue, <clears throat> there will be some um, some choppy waters when it comes to a tight labor market. You know, that's a labor market that um, affects, you know, you know, building a project and needing EPC labor. It affects us as an investment team, you know, looking for associates. It's it's uh, probably hitting everybody. And, and then same with materials. You know, you can hardly build a house right now. And, um, you know, I think some of that uh, some of that, uh, you know, material inflation could could hit parts of uh, the balance of system for for some of the things that we're doing. So, you know, long term, the future is is looking good. I think 2020, the last 12 months were more or less fine. Um, and and, and short term, um, there could be disruptions from a labor and supply chain perspective. But uh, overall, I think, uh, as we know, the administration is going to going to try to use uh, this industry as, as a way to rebuild out of the uh, the economic environment. Sure, absolutely. Rich, I'd love to hear you on this. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think that, uh, you know, from the COVID standpoint, uh, to Ben's comment about, you know, the, the, industry, the interest in the industry, I mean, we have over 150 uh, projects with, across something like 70 different off-takers, ranging from, you know, uh, Walmart to... Uh, a mausoleum uh, for as, that's operated as part of an archdiocese, and uh, you know, in New Jersey, and we had a total of zero defaults throughout all of COVID. Um, and I think that a lot of that goes to just what renewables are doing, right? Renewables, particularly in distributed generation, but anywhere that they're being deployed, they're saving people money. So it ultimately makes sense to pay that bill relative to the alternative. Um, and uh, you know, the supply components of this will slow down, you know, those, those, those pressures will alleviate. I think that there might be uh, a different attitude towards, uh, the, you know, the just-in-time manufacturing perspective uh, around renewables, uh, because realistically, um, I think what is a really great signal for manufacturers is that this is a sustainable, prolonged demand. You know, you don't necessarily need to worry about if you're a panel manufacturer, whether or not there's going to be market growth, there will be market growth. The, you know, if you're an inverter manufacturer, uh, racking, whatever else, I mean, you you understand that it becomes less subject to policy whim, at which point maintaining a large inventory would not make economic sense to a world where, uh, you know, you know that it's actually going to hurt your business to the extent that you don't have that capacity available. Um, and... Uh, and just if you sort of think about the, the psychological impact of that for the people, you know, like us that have been in the industry for so long, I mean, uh, you know, we were always bullish about growth, but but this is just a different level uh, than, than I think 
probably any of us expected within the time frame. Um, and so it's exciting to see, uh, and I think that it will um, it will change the industry more positively to come. But it will definitely be uh, it, it'll be a rough, I, I, I think, eighteen months, uh, eighteen to twenty four months from a from an execution standpoint. Yeah, you you lay that out really well, and it sounds like there's a lot a lot to feel optimistic about, but there there could be some some rough patches ahead. Obviously, Johanna, um, I'm curious how Clearway is is looking at this the space as you know we kind of hopefully are rounding the bed in in COVID recovery. Yeah, I mean I agree with everything that was said around. If anything, our um, managed to do well um, during the pandemic. And so apart from construction shutdowns and construction delays in some geographies, um, it's, it's, it's a business that is, um, that takes time. So you're preparing, you're developing, preparing, building it. it it's just, it, it takes, it takes a lot of time and, and and so that episode of COVID, even though it appeared to be very long to all of us, um, kind of, you know, our industry kind of just managed it. Some issues around supply chain, some issues around construction, uh, but overall coming out strong and coming out also as, as a population with some more awareness about what we do, I think. Um, awareness about our impact on, you know, the planet, our impact on climate, our impact on wildlife. So all those themes were talked about during COVID and I think that's great and that helps us. So I'm trying to, you know, see the good in, in what has happened in terms of bringing awareness um, on what we do. So coming out of COVID, there's, there's challenges that are related to shortages in general, shortages of, of people, shortages of, of, um, of some, you know, raw material and supply chain. So those shortages will have to be overcome, um, through investments. Um, but we see tremendous opportunities. So we're, you know, we're, we're, you know, hoping for the best that everything's behind us and that we can continue to grow. Um, one thing that, you know, uh, ben mentioned and like see kind of tie that to capital. Um, we see a lot of capital um, that is going to be um, allocated to our industry. A tremendous amount of, of private capital in addition to obviously government plans. And there's a lot of capital, but not a lot of good projects. And so the capital is going to be to need to rethink about how they invest. They're going to be, they're going to need to act more like VC. They're going to be, they're going to need to, you know, foray into other types of technologies, other types of projects, things that are, things that are a bit more earlier stage, all those themes. And that's going to help our industry. So, you know, we were talking a little bit about capital earlier. Um, I think there's, this is, great because there's there's a lot of capital but so the capital itself is going to need to think about how investments are made and the criteria to kind of expand more and be active earlier um so i'm i'm looking forward to see that as well that's great thank you you all touch on some really great points and finally i want to end off with this I want to ask each one of you, if you got a chance to sit down one-on-one -on -one with President Biden, I'm curious, what kind of support would you ask for in relation to your specific sectors? And wh whoever wants to start us off on this one, please feel free. I mean, I'll say, like, the, the goal is amazing, the, the plans are great continue to communicate, 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 and educate people because education is key to what we do, you know, and we need people, we need staff, we need support from the general population. And so I'd say like, just please spend the, spend the amount of time and the amount of money that is needed to continue educating people. Sure. Absolutely. Ben. 
Sure. Yeah. If, if he and I were chatting and he, you know, knew where he was and what was going on, I would, uh, I would tell him, you know, I, I just don't want to see some of the entrenched and more accepted technologies go the way of oil and gas, where the subsidies far outlast um, the usefulness or the time at which they were critical. And so to make sure that in a world where, you know, putting dollars into federal subsidies is a zero sum game, and he's always going to be fighting for what he can subsidize and whatnot to let let subsidies fall away, even sometimes if it's a little early in people's minds to to make sure that those same dollars, if it is a zero sum game, go into what is next, you know, so that so that again, 20 years from now, solar is not the oil and gas, you know, still getting subsidized by whatever process in Washington causes that to happen. Makes sense. Good ask so far. Well, I think I'd, I'd want to get some feedback on him on, on how the industry can continue to be um, equitable, and maybe it's just messaging, but making sure that you know uh, a big part of uh, the country that is not necessarily his constituency benefits immensely from wind and is starting to benefit immensely from solar. And just trying to find a way in which that message can be better uh, understood, better heard, better better relayed, so that people realize that this is um, actually, you know, the renewable energy, clean energy growth throughout the United States is not just benefiting a very small group of people, and not just benefiting people that may have voted for him, but it's actually uh, supporting everyone. Um, and so, figuring out a better way to do that is something I'd want to talk to him about. Sure, sure, absolutely. And finally, Rich. <laughs> but I'm Maybe sure Rich has something on. super interesting to say. <laughs> Rich? I think we're, I think we might be frozen. It looks frozen. Yeah, it ha it happens during every virtual panel that I've that I've been on for sure. <laughs> okay, well, uh, you know what? That just means that we all have to meet again and come back again for a uh, a second panel. So I'm holding you all to that. And uh, that thank you so much again, all of you. What a great conversation! Really insightful and interesting. Um, that wraps us up for today. Just huge, huge thank you and, and kudos to our talented panel. Uh, we look forward to having you all back. And also I wanna thank all of our, our attendees. We really hope you enjoyed the conversation and please stay tuned for future MPM interconnection forums. Thank you all. <laughs>